Welcome to our final class in Unstoppable Truth of the Word of God. I'm Camille Farrow, and you and I have been studying together for the last several months of Unstoppable Truth. Today we are going to be talking about the superhero powers of the Word of God, these wild miracles, and how they happen and how they operate. And I want to tell you that everything that I have taught you are principles that I have put into practice in my own life. And because I have worked and put these principles into my life and walked them out, believed them, operated in them, I could tell you right now a hundred miracles that are in my path, in my own life. I've seen my son healed of 10 seizures a day. I have seen um, God provide every dime for this TV show, every dollar, every, uh, the, the whole amount all at once to pay for this TV show to come to you on air. I have seen miracles, signs, and wonders. I've seen people healed. I have seen awesome, awesome things. And I want to continue now and just show you some of these supernatural, amazing things and kind of some of the, the interesting things that I see beyond them. So let's look at the multiplication of the food that Jesus did. He broke bread, it says in Mark chapter 6, uh, verses 41 through 42, and he took the five loaves and two fish, and he looked up to heaven and praising God, gave thanks and broke the loaves and kept on giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And he also divided the two fish among them all as well. And it says in a different uh, gospel, it says that he fed 5,000 men, not including the women and children. So we're talking at least 15,000 people were fed in one little meal, one lunch of a child, of a kid. Now, I believe that if we want to see multiplication of food, we have to do it just the way Jesus did it. So take this verse and do it. Look up to heaven, praise God, and as you're praising God, give him thanks for this loaf of bread, and break that bread, and then begin to distribute it. I have heard of uh, enough food to feed 100 homeless people, and 500 homeless people have showed up, and God let, just kept feeding them, and they kept feeding them, and they kept feeding them, and there was still more meat, more meat, more meat. They even had half of the meat that they had prepared left over. There was so much meat. I have heard awesome testimonies of God multiplying food and, and, and blessing the food and multiplying it, but we have to do it the way he did it. I believe that every miracle that Jesus Christ did stems out of the Old Testament. There's some miracle that the saints of old did that Jesus began to manifest himself. And for this one here, I believe it was King David when he danced and he brought the Ark of the Covenant home. David's the only guy that fed an entire nation. And I believe that Jesus um, fed the nation of Israel at the time uh, with all those that were present um, based on that miracle in the Old Testament. <clears throat> in some locations, especially where people are truly desperate for God, they are crying out to God with every fiber of their being. They are worshiping him with unhindered fear, reverence, and awe. And they are just absolutely passionately in love with God. There are gemstones that are appearing just out of thin air. They're pure. They're perfect. Gemologists can't describe them or define them. They are perfect. And I believe it's based on this scripture in Isaiah 61.10. And it says that I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and he has robed me with the robes of righteousness. As a bridegroom bedecks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. I believe these jewels are God adorning the bride of Christ that is truly walking in the wisdom of God. And our wisdom is to reverentially and worshipfully fear God. When we worship him and reverence him, we can have, I believe that God will manifest those and adorn us with his gemstones. There's weird things that happen in the Christian circles, and it's gold dust. Sometimes it's in the air. Sometimes it's on people's clothing. It's just appearing out of nowhere. And I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but I will tell you that in Job chapter 28, he talks about the gold dust. He talks about miners who mine the earth. They, they swing from ropes and they dig crevices and paths. They uproot mountains by their roots. And their rewards are beds of sapphires, gold dust, 
all kinds of beautiful objects and things underneath the surface of the earth. Then he shifts gears and goes into wisdom. And what is God's wisdom? Basically, wisdom is 100% God's. It's none of ours. The only reason why we have any kind of wisdom is because God has given it to us and let us look and let us see and know a little bit about him. Well, in this wisdom, in these wisdom scriptures, the very, very last one says, and the wisdom of man is to reverentially and worshipfully fear him. When we begin to do that, I believe that God, gold dust from heaven, whatever you want to call it, I believe it. I believe it happens. I believe it is supernatural. It is a sign and wonder. But I believe that Job chapter 28 will really help crack the code on it for you. Um, you know, in the Bible, there were people who start and stopped the rain. It says that the two witnesses will start and stop rain. My boys and I, when we've, we've had terrible thunderstorms that have come near us, we pray and we say, I speak to the energy of the storm, peace be still and be calm. And in like 10 seconds, we hear it like miles away. And my kids have gotten so good at it that they're even teaching their friends how to do that. But it is a superpower. It comes from the Old Testament. Elijah stopped the rain for three and a half years. Elijah started the rain after the three and a half years. So uh, that's in 1 Kings uh, 17, verse 1, and, uh, and so on. Um, in Goshen, when the Israelites were in Goshen in Egypt, and the ten plagues were coming upon Egypt, in Goshen, not, none of the plagues came upon them. I believe that there can be a supernatural shield of God's protection I believe that there can be like this Goshen protection through any plague, anything that, the, that can come upon the earth. We're going to talk about translation. What does that mean? If, if you've ever seen a Star Trek uh, episode, they use this term called beam me up Scotty, and the guy would go from the spaceship and land on the, the planet that they wanted to go to, and it would happen in just a few seconds. And they would disappear from here and arrive over here. Well, translation by faith is actually a, a true thing, and it is in the Bible. Philip is probably the most famous example of it in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 26 through 40. And when the, Philip was witnessing to this eunuch, the eunuch wanted to be baptized in the river. So Philip baptized him in the water, and as the eunuch came out of the water, Philip completely disappeared and landed in a city 28 miles away. He was translated. Now, there are other scriptures in the Bible that talk about this. Elijah translated. Um, and it, people were so used to him translating that when he went up in the fiery chariot, they, went, they said, well, let's go see if by the Spirit he was moved to a mountain or to a desert. Can we go look? Elisha said, no, no, don't bother. He's gone for good. And they're like, no, we want to go look. They were used to having to hunt for him out in the desert and out on the mountaintops. So Elijah let them, Elisha let them go. Here's some other examples. Ezekiel talks about a hand took him by the lock of his head and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heavens and brought me into the visions of God of Jerusalem, to Jerusalem. In the book of Revelation, we saw three or four different encounters that John had where he says he was wrapped in the spirit. He was moved up to heaven in 4 verse 1. In, um, uh, he was moved uh, and wrapped in the spirit out into a desert. He was moved and wrapped to a sandy beach. He was translated. By the way, Jesus and Satan translated too on the last day of his 40-day fast. They moved from the desert to the top of the temple to the top of a mountain in one day. There's no way you could have walked all of that in one day. You can learn more about that at a book called Gazing into Glory by Bruce Allen. He's really done a lot of biblical research on that and really can explain translation by faith. I believe the saints in the last days will be operating in that power. The doors have been closed for many, many centuries, but now that door is going to begin to open. Let's look at the verse Isaiah 60, verse 8. I love this scripture. It says, who are these that fly like the clouds, like doves to their nests? There are people that will fly like the clouds. And I believe it's talking about translation there. Also talking about the rapture, the resurrection of the dead, when we're changed and we're flying to the clouds with Jesus. I believe it's called the dove company. <clears throat> there is also something called a transporter. 
There's a translation in the Bible where there's a, something that transports them. Think about Elijah. Remember when Elijah again went up in the fiery chariot? That fiery chariot transported him between earth and heaven. Let's look at an example in the New Testament. Adam, if you'll throw up uh, John 6, 21. It says, Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Guess what? Thirteen men were in the boat. And when Jesus stepped into the boat, the boat itself was translated to the other side of the shore. They were immediately on the other side of the, the Sea of Galilee. And that's called, in, and this is my term, it's called a transporter. It's a way of translating a group or a body of people <clears throat> in, in a moment, in an instant of time. I have heard buses going from here to there, what should have taken them five hours of time, and they, they got there instantaneously. And the whole group of people that were on it got there fast. I have a friend just recently, and he and his buddy were in a car, and they were stuck in traffic. And they had to be at an embassy to give a speech. It was a very important meeting that they were missing because of traffic. And they were stuck behind a truck, and they were so mad about the truck, they were two hours away, and then all of a sudden, their uh, GPS said, your exit's on the left. And they got off, and they were there. Two hours just disappeared in a moment of time. I believe that some of this is like time compression, and God can compress that time. An example of this in the Bible is in 1 Kings 18, verse 46. And this is where Elisha, Elijah said to King Ahab, he saw the little cloud that was the size of his hand. It was about to begin to rain. And he told Elijah and the king's chariot and his horses to race back to the castle before he gets wet or else he'll get stuck in the mud, basically. And then it says, Elijah picked up his garments and began to run and beat him back, the, horse, the king's horses and chariot, back to the, the kingdom. And he did it in a, in a compressed amount of time, and he was zapped from here to there. The sun stood still in Joshua 10, 13, and the moon stopped um, until the people had revenge on their enemies. So the sun can stand still. Let's talk about defying matter and this miraculous thing when Jesus walked on the water. I believe that that's defying gravity, because when he walked on, when people go on water, guess what? They sink because of gravity. Where does this come from in the Old Testament? And one of the things that the Lord showed me is there's a little testimony in um, 2 Kings 6, verses 5 and 6. And there were some guys that were chopping down a tree, and their axe head fell into the water. And the Son of Man came along, and he said, he smacked the water with his cloak, and the axe head began to float. The axe head defied gravity. So based on this miraculous principle in the Old Testament, Jesus was able to do it in the New Testament. There's some really good books about quantum physics and Christianity. Quantum physics is a fascinating science. I love it. It's uh, fun to tinker with. And I love these uh, books. They're called Quantum Glory by Phil Mason and The Physics of Heaven by Judy Franklin. And I believe that, uh, that Christians are now beginning to move into the understanding of what quantum is. Quantum says that every single molecule is suspended and vibrating because of a sound wave. Guess what that sound wave was? God spoke, and it came into existence, and it came into being. Every atom has a vibration, a sound vibration in it, and I believe it's the voice of God that's there. In the last days, you will be hidden. In Zephaniah 2, verse 3, I'm going to read the whole scripture. It's fascinating. It says, Seek the Lord and inquire of him while he is able to be found. All you humble of the land who have acted in compliance with his revealed will and have kept his commandments and seek righteousness and seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's great anger. God will be able to hide you. In several other scriptures, Psalm 91, Psalm 36, Isaiah 49, it talks about being hidden under the shadow of God's wing, being hidden under his feathers. I believe that we can take these scriptures, decree them about our lives, that when we need it, God will hide us. And he will keep us protected and shielded. I believe that there will be fire coming down from heaven. Many of the, the uh, men of old saw fire miraculously come out of heaven. King David saw fire come out of heaven in 1 Chronicles 21, verse 26. And it ignited um, his sacrifice that was on the, the, his burnt offering. 
Solomon saw fire from heaven. Elijah saw fire from heaven. The, it talks about uh, in Revelation 8, the saints will see fire from heaven. And the false prophet will be able to call down fire from heaven too. So don't follow all the fire. Just know that you want God's fire and not anybody else's. I believe that this is part of David's uh, anointing, the Davidic anointing at the end of the age. I believe that it's part of David's tabernacle that's going to be reestablished at the end of the age. I believe that there's going to be fire that's going to fall in miraculous ways and answer all of the prayers of the saints. I believe that we can pursue God and <clears throat> pursue him with confidence and with faith and boldly become, come before his throne because of his grace. And listen to this verse. It's in Numbers chapter 6. The Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord will lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And so they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. This is the ironic blessing said over the Israelites during the days of Moses and Aaron. And this, when it talks about God's face will shine upon you, it is talking about his name, his countenance, his presence coming with you. And it's a great prayer to pray. I pray it over my boys every day when I send them off to school. But we can have this going from glory to glory, and we can move and encounter his face. In him and through him, through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and in confidence. That's Ephesians chapter 3. Now I want you to look at this Bible verse, Isaiah 4, verses 5 and 6. And the Lord will create over the whole site, over the dwelling place of Mount Zion, and over her assemblies, a cloud of smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory shall be a canopy of defense, of divine love and protection. And it shall be a shade for them in the, from the, heat, in the daytime from the heat, and a place of refuge and shelter from the storms and from the rain. This is talking about when the Israelites were out in the desert for 40 years with Moses talks about how they had a pillar of fire at night and they had a cloud to shade them in the day. But here's what I want you to catch. Isaiah lets us in on a little secret. And over it all, the cloud and the fire, there was a bubble or a canopy of God's glory. And inside of this God's glory and inside of this bubble of God's glory, this is what happened. Their clothes never wore out for 40 years. Their shoes never wore out for 40 years. Moses' eyes and ears didn't dim with age at 120 years old. He still had the strength of the youth to climb a mountain. Caleb's and Joshua's strength didn't fade or dim either as they got older. They all had the strength of their youth. So what I'm saying is that in the bubble or canopy of God's glory, the second law of thermodynamics is reversed. The second law of thermodynamics says that everything is going from a state of order to a state of disorder and being broken up. <clears throat> children and young people are in order their bodies are in order as we get older and older and older and older our bodies go into disorder and chaos that's the second law of thermodynamics it's an operation there under the bubble of God's glory that law got suspended things went, were, went from order and stayed in order it's really the fountain of youth it's really where things don't deteriorate corrode, die, break apart go into chaos you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, have the glory of God dwelling on the inside of us. And we can release the bubble of God's glory round about us to be a shelter from storms, to be a shade for us, to be all kinds of things for us. And you can release the bubble of God's glory. I want to remind you to decree all of these scriptures, all of these wild and interesting things. Decree them over their life. Decree that that uh, scripture in um, uh, Matthew 10, 7 and 8. Go, preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers. Go for it. This is your time. This is our day. I want to tell you in um, Daniel 12, verse 3, to shine like the stars. I believe that as the last days approaches, as the darkness gets darker, the light is going to shine brighter. Daniel 12, verse 3 says, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. <clears throat> you will, you, Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says that you are the light of the world. 
Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good and moral excellence, and that they may praise and worship your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine. Stand for the truth, the unstoppable truth of the word of God. You and I have now gotten to the end of unstoppable truth study. Thank you for studying with me. What have we studied? We have studied five mysteries in the New Testament. Each one of these mysteries are a theme in the book of Revelation. It's the mystery of God's will. It is the mystery of Israel's hardening in Romans chapter 11. It is the mystery of lawlessness, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It is the mystery of the resurrection of the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. And finally, it's the great mystery, the mystery of marriage. How this mystery of marriage is the greatest mystery of all. As Jesus Christ laid his life down 2,000 years ago, and he conquered everything with the shedding of his blood, so the bride will lay her life down for what she believes in and whom she loves. She loves her God, she loves her Savior Jesus, and she loves her Holy Spirit so much. She calls them her best friend. And saints, church, believe me, you better be calling them your best friend. And you better not give up your faith for any reason, for anything. And as she lays her life down, guess what? She accomplishes something too. She becomes more than a conqueror, victorious in all things, overcomes Satan, and he gets bound for a thousand years. Do not think that, that martyrdom doesn't accomplish anything. It does. We have to begin to wrap our brains around these five mysteries. We have to study and know the book of Revelation. It's not really about interpreting it unless the book itself gives us interpretation or other scriptures in the Bible give us the interpretation. Zechariah is a big one, and Daniel is a big, big, uh, big book. So both of those are books that help you interpret the book of Revelation. As you get to know those scriptures and memorize those scriptures, know them, keep them, lay them to your heart, read them out loud with a group of people, let them hear it being read out loud. Everybody will be blessed who begins to study and know the book of Revelation. Outline it from the beginning to the end. And... Um, begin to understand the unstoppable truth. God spoke it, and it is going to come to pass. So please familiarize yourself. Read it over and over and over again, especially the book of Revelation, Daniel, Zechariah as well, because they are keys to helping you in the days, the darker days that are ahead for us. Stay true to the word of God. Stay true to him. If you haven't made your decision to become a Christian yet, secretly, in your heart, right now, give it all over to him. Let him hear your cry. Let, and you, you, prayer is just like talking to a person. It's not, there's no formality to it. You don't have to do it a certain way. Any, you, any way you do it is going to be the right way. Just ask. Just ask. And when you ask the first time, throughout the rest of your days, Every day, begin to ask. Let him lead you. Let him guide you. Ask, what do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go today? How do you want me to behave today? And he will take you on an adventure every single day. It is the greatest adventure this life has to offer. I hope that you've enjoyed understanding the crash course of Christianity here at the end, understanding some really awesome biblical truths. And I hope that you will continue to study unstoppable truth. Remember, you can get this entire TV series. You can get the, the PowerPoint series with my voice teaching in greater detail at my website, unstoppabletruthministries.com. It's all free. Freely I've been given. Freely I want to give to you. I hope you'll take the time and spend the time studying and sharing with others. I know your heart is going to begin to burn for the truth of God's word. Let me speak a blessing over you. Lord, I pray that you will bless everyone under the sound of my voice, that the power of your word, the fire that's on your word will be released and that all of heaven will go forth to back up every word that has been spoken and said. I thank you that you are releasing the greatest miracles on planet earth and the greatest harvest of souls is going to come in, in these days ahead. Thank you, Father God. Bless everybody. I love you. Amen.
Thank <laughs> you.